No, this isn't a tasting video. We're gonna make mead. All right, we're gonna be making a piment port. Why? Because a million people have asked me to make a port. Here's the problem. I can't make a port because I'm not in Portugal. That's the only way you can actually make a port. It's kind of like champagne that way. There's a rule that says you can't do it. However, I can make a port-like product, and because we're not making a real port, I'm gonna make a mead port, which is gonna be a piment port because we're using grape. Got all that? Now, what's in these glasses? This stuff right here. The fanciest brandy that I could get for less than 50 bucks at Total Wine & More. <laughs> Uh, why are we drinking brandy, Brian? Because what is port? Port is a fortified wine. So in our case, our pie port port's going to be a fortified mead, and I'm going to fortify it with this. Port is traditionally fortified with a spirit made from grapes, so we are going to be using brandy. Um, this particular one has, like, all these amazing notes to it, and it's got some spiciness, it's got uh, a dry fruit, like a raisiny kind of flavor. I'll drink this all on its own. I really like this, okay? I'm more of a whiskey guy, but this is nice. So in adding this to a mead, we said, all right, well, if we just add this to a straight up grape wine mead, it's not really all that great. So we came up with a few other ingredients to add. To make our piment port, we're going to need three quarts of Concord grape juice. Now I'm using Concord grape juice because A, this is Nudson's brand, it's easy to get, it's not super cheap, but it's a really high quality. I mean, here's the ingredients. Juice from ripe, whole, organic Concord grapes, period. That's it. There's nothing else. Now, if yours has ascorbic acid or anything like that, it's fine. What you're trying to avoid is the um, sulfites and sorbates, things like that. Those are preservatives. They can inhibit fermentation. We're also going to be using honey. Now, I'm using orange blossom honey. This happens to be the sweet squeeze stuff. We'll have links to this in the description. I'm going to be using 1.75 pounds of that honey today because I have a very specific number of gravity that I'm trying to get to. So I want to use just a specific amount. Going over the real basics here. We're also going to be using some brandy. Now this is a 40% alcohol. I'm going to be using a four to one ratio. For every four parts of bead, I'm gonna use one part of brandy. More on that later on, different video actually. It'll be the second part. In addition to that, I'm going to be using the peel of a mandarin orange. I love mandarin oranges. They are not exactly orange, but they're, they have a little bit of orange essence to them and they're very fruity and the peel is incredible for aromatics. So I think it's going to add this wonderful flavor profile to this. Then, because we're using Concord grapes and they tend to be very sweet, we need something that cuts that. So a little bit of tartness, something that adds a little bit more uh, body and tannin to things. But so we also we're looking for a floral note and it's really difficult to get that tart, almost citrusy essence with a floral note, unless you use... Hibiscus. I used a whole ounce of dried hibiscus leaves in a cup and a half of water or so to make this tea. It is deep red. It smells incredible. And I think that mixed with the orange peel, mixed with the honey, mixed with the Concord grape is going to make a really spectacular wine all on its own. So that's like recipe A. But we did ask you guys what to add and hibiscus was up there, orange peel was up there. There was also allspice berries. Where's the allspice berries? Well, guess what? They're gonna be added in conditioning phase because they can be a little bit of an antibiotic and they might hinder fermentation, so we are not taking any chances with this. But to get the fermentation started, we are also going to be using Lalvin K1V1116 yeast. Why am I using that yeast, you might ask? Well, because it's got a relatively high alcohol tolerance and it's known for bringing out fruity flavors, which we have a fruity flavor, a fruity flavor, and a fruity flavor, plus some fruity flavor. I want to bring all those flavors together. Therefore, Lalvin K1V it is. And to keep the yeast happy, we have some Fermade O. I'm using two grams today because I actually read that uh, you're supposed to add a little bit more after a couple days. I'm not bothering with all that scheduling and all that kind of stuff. I like to add it in the front. So I'm just gonna use two grams and I think that'll be, become my new standard so long as it works. I did dilute it in a little bit of water because it's so much easier to get it into the solution that way. Anyway, let's get started. So we have our one gallon fermenter, we have our stainless steel funnel, and we have our scale. All these things, well, except for the scale, have been sanitized in the red bucket of sanitization! 
which is right there. Look at that. As I said, 1.75 pounds of honey. Now, if you want to figure out your gravities, honey adds 0 0.035 points of specific gravity per pound in a gallon of must. This is a one gallon batch. If you want to make a five gallon batch, you do everything times five. If you want to make a three gallon batch, you do everything times three. If you want to make a 20 gallon batch, you might want to wait till the end of the series to make sure that this comes out good first. <laughs> so 1.75 pounds of honey, weighing it in, I teared out my scale. <laughs> While I wait for the rest of the honey to come out, I'm gonna peel this orange. I'm just using a regular old peeler, trying to get just the skin rather than the, uh, the pith, if you will. These guys are the cuties, though, from Publix, that you can basically just, like, peel it. And I'm probably just gonna do that. Yeah, they're super easy to peel, and they really don't have a very thick pith layer, no. so... And I'm breaking the skin into little pieces on purpose so that it's, uh, you know, pieces inside the brew rather than a big chunk of peel. And we have a lovely plate of orange peel. And I know, because somebody's gonna ask, so what are you gonna do with the orange until you peel it? I'm gonna eat it. Okay, so we have our honey in here, but it's kind of filled up the funnel and it's kind of nasty in there. So my hibiscus tea. Now this is still warm, but not hot. And it's steeped for 10 minutes, if anybody really needed to know. I like to do that for hibiscus. Longer than that gets a little bit more bitter. Not enough time, and it doesn't really fully get in there. So I like to do 10 minutes. I'm just pouring around the edge of the funnel to uh, get rid of any of that excess honey. Got most of it. Yeah. We still have all the grape juice to add anyway, so... Oh yeah. It's, it's gonna get in there. Next. I have Fermaid O. Now this is the nutrient. If you really don't want to use nutrients, you probably can get away with not using it for this. Um, it's not going to be that high of a gravity and there's other things in here that will act as a nutrient. So you'll probably be fine. I'm doing this just as a precaution, just to be on the safe side. And you know, it's a natural thing, so I'm okay with it. Fermaid O is the organic version. It contains nitrogen and other nutrients necessary for the yeast to consume honey. And I just mixed it with a little bit of water, pour it in, there we go. And now, the juice. Now when you buy juices like this, you want to shake them really good before Whoops. you open them because yeah, a lot of bottom. times stuff will settle on the bottom and that stuff is good stuff for your yeast. So you want that in your brew and any sediment like that is going to resettle out during the fermentation process and you will rack it away and have a clear brew, but you'll have happy yeast in the meantime. At this point though, there's honey in here that I need to mix up. So I'm going to get my thumb saver bung. Oh, it's over here. <laughs> we got this for Christmas. This is little Lee yeast plushie. <laughs> it's our mascot. I just haven't come up with a name yet. Oh, if anybody has a good name for the yeast mascot of City Steading, leave it below in the comments. I'm really curious. I, I want to actually hold a contest to see what name gets, gets named. Yeah, what we name it or something. So I like to use a solid bong, put it in there, and I'm going to shake the bejesus out of this. Now, when I say that, what I mean by bejesus is, I don't know, I just started <laughs> saying it years ago and I keep doing it. I just mean shake the heck out of it. You can see down here that we have a bunch of the honey stuck to the bottom and we want that to be unified throughout the solution and that's why we shake it. Also, we shake it so that we can oxygenate our brew. Oxygen is an important ingredient at the beginning of fermentation stage, so that way your yeast can be fruitful and multiply to <laughs> eat up all those sugars. But do they do this? I can't, I can't do it with that hand. Do they do it like this? <laughs> I, I broke that finger. They, well, they don't live long, but they do prosper. Their colony may live long. They go dormant, they don't die. Well, we're gonna... We're, we're, well, we may not, we're killing them, actually. Yes. No, they go dormant, they go dormant. Fortification, they go dormant. Oh, okay. Yeah. By the way, in case you're curious, fortification, like we said earlier, really just means to add a spirit to a wine or a mead or a brew. And what it does is it basically overpowers the yeast. It goes beyond their tolerance for alcohol. They just say, nope, I'm done. And that's it, it stops fermenting. Dansk Mod actually uses fortification a lot in their meads. 
That way they can keep it more natural without having to use preservatives. They don't have to pasteurize either because they have fortified. It is a way to do it. To me, you are going to be diluting the flavor of the mead a bit. So it's not something I want to do all the time, but it does have its uses. That looks relatively mixed. Yeah. Time for the next grape juice addition. Gotta shake the bottle, get all that good stuff. So at this point too, I'm going to put in the orange peel and I'm literally just sticking them through there. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be super precise here. They'll, they'll come back out later, don't you worry. Before Brian peeled that orange, I made sure to scrub it really well with a, a vegetable brush that we use only for our vegetables. So that way if there was any oddities on the exterior that got cleaned away, uh, you could sanitize it if you really were totally paranoid. We weren't, as long as I scrubbed it well, so. Yeah, some people will run it through, like they'll dip it in star sand or something, and you can totally do that if you really want to. Um, to me, the tiny little bit that might have passed through the scrubbing, the alcohol is gonna kill it off. So not really all that concerned. Number three. Okay, I'm gonna pour this one more carefully because we, we're starting to build up some foam and I don't really wanna have foam issues. Speaking of foam, we've had some foam issues where we see this huge head of foam build up from the shaking process, the aeration process, and thank you all for all of your input. I've received dozens upon dozens, hundreds, dare I say thousands of suggestions on how to eliminate foam. Some of them quite good, some of them I'm not so sure that I'd want to do that to my meat, but I do appreciate you guys giving me feedback and input because it's actually really, really cool. That's one of the things that I like about this is getting to read the comments and write back to you guys. I try to get back as much as I can. It's getting a little harder. Um, I hate to say it, but with the channel getting a little bit bigger, it gets a little bit more difficult to keep up um, with 400 and something videos out there now. It, and so you can comment on any one of those and we see them all. Um, I'm also stalling just a little bit so that maybe some of that foam goes away. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we, we do really appreciate the input, so keep them coming. Um, as far as how to really eliminate it though, the best way is time. There's really no other way to get rid of it than time. However, at this point, for the sake of time, I'm gonna add my yeast. Well, we still need to shake it again. Do you want I to can shake? shake it once the yeast is in there. Okay. And I gotta take a reading too. Right. But. There's always been some talk about, oh, what if you take a reading after you add the yeast or before you add the yeast, does it matter? If you take it right away, it really doesn't matter at all. The yeast is not gonna change that reading and it hasn't started making alcohol yet. So it's not really a factor at all. I'm putting it in now because I don't wanna have to make room later. I don't want it to get stuck on the sides. By the way, this is a Lalvin product, which means, look at that. I can open it with just my hands. I don't need to get a pair of scissors anything like that. And I am using a whole packet of yeast. It's kind of the way we do things now. We found it to be kind of superior in almost every way. Yes, it is a little bit wasteful. Some people will say it's wasteful. Um, to me, it guarantees a clean fermentation. It guarantees a good startup and it's worked really, really well for us. So I'm doing it. If you find yourself in a situation that you need to be slightly more frugal, frugal than that, and go ahead and use one full teaspoon of yeast per one US gallon. Or half a packet, either way. By the way, thwack your packet. It's important. It's my PSA for the day. I was also hoping that by dropping the yeast in it might break up some of the foam. So there was, there was multiple reasons for doing the yeast the way I did. Thwack your packet needs to become a t-shirt. It has come up multiple times. I've heard this multiple times. I'm saying it on camera now so that you... Great, thanks. All right, let's see if I can pour some more juice in there. I was hoping to get all three quarts in there. That doesn't go in there. <laughs> I'm hoping to break up some of the foam just a little bit. Because right now I'm not even past the shoulder yet. This is gonna be way too high of a gravity at this moment. So I want to be able to uh, add some more of that juice in there. I know I just made a big deal about all the suggestions that everybody gave me and right off the top of my head, I can't think of one right now. <laughs> so I'm just gonna do this. 
Some of them were actually really good. Others in involved removing the foam, which uh, worries me a little bit. Um, some of them were a little bit risky. Uh, people said using brushes and things like that stuck in there. I'm a little bit afraid of that. Um, so be careful in how you decide to remove the foam. Personally, I think the natural method, just letting it sit is probably the best way, but we're making a video here. I don't have time to let this sit. Ain't nobody got time for that. That's old now, isn't it? I think so. It's okay, it's still funny. <laughs> it will never not be funny. I'm going to risk it. Okay, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna take a reading now and see what we're at. Because there is a possibility that it'll be a little bit too high, but when the foam goes down, I can add more later. So we might just do it that way. So let's take a reading. Now, when I say take a reading, I mean a hydrometer reading to get the specific gravity of our must, which that's what this is now. It's a must. It's, you know, a must. All right, so what we have is a 1.114 original gravity, which is pretty respectable. It's not as high as I, was afraid it might be from having not enough liquid in here. So that's kind of a good thing. I believe my projected gravity was 1.100. So I'm only 14 points above that. Not really a problem. I'm gonna go with it. What that means is, I'm gonna put this back in, give it a couple more quick little shakes to make sure everything is completely dissolved in there or as close as I can get it. And then we're going to put an airlock and a bung on it. So we put an airlock and a bung. There's a couple kinds of airlocks on the market. I like the S-type, it's just my personal preference. The three piece, the other ones that are more round, they are easier to clean, I will give you that. We put sanitizer fluid in here, not actual sanitizer, not the star stain itself, but sanitizer fluid. Once it's been mixed, okay, the same stuff we've been cleaning everything in, you can use, you know, vodka, liquor, whatever you want. Don't use plain water. Bugs and things can still get through that and live. That's not what you want. And don't use isopropyl alcohol either, please. Oh yeah, don't do that, that's toxic. You don't wanna put anything in here that you can't actually drink. Now I don't wanna go drinking a glass of star sand fluid, but it's probably not going to kill me where a glass of isopropyl alcohol will. So, you know, one of those little things. Um, anyway, if your bung doesn't stay in like this one is getting a little bit loose, we'll just stick a rubber band on there later. But the really important thing that I wanna get across now is label. Let me find a writing implement. I know I had it's one around here hanging. somewhere. There it is. <laughs> the chaos that is our kitchen when we're brewing. So this is our Piment Port. Today is January 14th, 2022. We added almost three quarts. <laughs> 2.75 quarts of grape juice. 1.75 pounds orange blossom honey. We added um, one ounce dry hibiscus tea. I had to say dry because you can use fresh hibiscus too. So it's ma a tea made from the dry leaves. That's the important thing. Peel of one mandarin orange. Two grams of fermato. And K1V1116 yeast. I don't know where they get these names. I think because they're all laboratory created, it's probably that version. But is there a K1V1115? Quite possibly. And 1117? Like, is 1117 better than 1116? Are they holding out on us? I, you know. <laughs> anyway, from there, no holds barred, masking tape. This comes on and off and gets removed and gets reused. Don't worry about it. Labels, you know, should be easy to read, and that's about it. And from here, this is gonna sit for a while while it starts up. Once it starts up, we'll be back to show you what it looks like. Forgot one thing on my note. 1.114 starting gravity. Very important. Start the pen too. So it's been a couple hours. We have activity in that airlock already, as you can see. It's not super active yet, but it's definitely doing something. And if I look, eh, I don't really see anything inside yet, but let's, uh, let's take a little bit of a closer look, shall we? So you can clearly see that the airlock is moving and so are my hands as I try to hold the camera, sorry. Oh, come on, you can do it. I just said, I just talked you up. You can do it. You can do it. There it is. Okay, and as we get down inside, there's that foam. Now that's from earlier. It's starting to break up a little bit. When we get down inside though, not a whole lot. I mean, I see a little bit of activity right in there at the top of the surface line there. 
So, you know, it's it's starting up. It's uh, it's getting there. So we get down inside. It's very dark. It's very hard to see. So we're just going to leave it at that. It started up. And how long do you think this will take? Two weeks? Three weeks? Something like that. 1.114. Not a super high gravity, but not super low either. Gives uh, somewhere in the, you know what? I have a calculator right here. 0.114 times 135. That would be about 15.4% if this goes dry. So it's pretty reasonable. I'm gonna give this probably two, three weeks and we'll be back with another reading in the next part of this video. As always guys, thanks so much for watching and have a great day. Bye bye. Port is traditionally fortified with a grape. Oh. Port is traditionally fortified. Port is tradition. <laughs>